Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's guest webinar on trademarks. Um, just before we begin, I just wanted to go through uh, a couple of little bits of housekeeping, and then I'll pass this over to Tanya, our guest speaker today. Um, so if you've not done one of our Zoom webinars before, we can't hear or see you during the presentation. So if you do want to talk to us, then you'll either have to use the chat button at the bottom of your screen, or you'll have to use the Q&A button to ask Tanya a question about her presentation as we're going through. If you've registered for this webinar and put in your CPD number, your CPD points will automatically be added for you. Today's uh, webinar is going to be targeted towards business owners and senior managers. Um, so if you are a pest control technician, you're more than welcome to stay, but you might not get the most out of this talk. Um, shortly, I'm going to pass you over to Tanya Clark, who's from the Chartered Institute of Trademark Attorneys. Uh, it's a subject that we've seen members be caught out on before. So it is an important subject and it's one of those things that regularly we only think about when something goes wrong. So uh, if you do have any questions throughout the whole of the talk, please do use that Q&A box at the bottom. If anything goes wrong or if there's any technical issues, use the chat button and me or one of my colleagues will try and get you sorted out. But I think that's it from me and I'm going to pass you over to Tanya now. Thank you so much, Scott, and thank you to the British Pest Control Association for inviting me along to give this talk. Um, I actually live uh, just near London Bridge near the office, so unfortunately I have had cause to um, use your services or rather your members' services. And um, I just, I'm very keen to kind of explain what trademarks are about. We will be touching on other forms of protected registration like designs. Um, and a tiny bit on the unregistered designs and copyright, and I'll explain briefly what the differences are with patents as well. The uh, Chartered Institute of Trademark Attorneys uh, was founded in 1934. It acquired its charter in 2016, so we can now call ourselves Chartered Trademark Attorneys rather than just Trademark Attorneys. We are a professional association and we have over 1,600 trademark and design legal professionals. Chartered trademark attorneys specialize in trademarks and in designs and undertake professional qualifications. It usually takes about three to four years and you work at the same time as taking the examinations, which used to be examined internally, but are now externally examined by two universities. We are also litigators, some of us, with specialist knowledge of proceedings before the IP courts, that is IPEC, the IP Enterprise Court, which is part of the High Court. And there is also a special small claims division of IPEC, which deals exclusively with trademarks and with unregistered designs. So you can actually avoid um, the full high, kind of high court system and just go to the small claims and get an injunction within usually about six to nine months. Um, and it's relatively reasonable in terms of court fees and uh, also they discourage any form of oral hearing. So it's a relatively quick procedure. And one to remember if your threats letter hasn't succeeded, uh, just start mentioning you're going to go to the small claims court and um, you might succeed based on that. So um, some of you might know this, but I thought it would be useful just to explain basically what is a trademark. The definition of a trademark is incredibly broad. People keep on forgetting that essentially it's a sign which um, is capable of being represented in a manner which enables the registrar and the public to determine the clear and precise subject matter of the protection afforded. So that's the first test. And the second test is it needs to be capable of distinguishing the goods or the services of one undertaking or one company or enterprise from those of another. So as I said, it's incredibly broad. It can cover not just the normal thing which you would think about, like a name. Uh, it can also cover a design of a product. It can cover an acronym, letters, uh, the shape of the goods, 3D objects, colors, and even musical jingles. So you can file these now, not just in a 2D format, but also electronically. So in terms of a, a musical notation form, um, you can just file it electronically 
and that's how it is um, pretty much in the UK and the EU and quite a number of countries elsewhere. So what constitutes um, infringement? Well, if you're using uh, the brand, the mark on the goods or on packaging, if you're putting goods on the market under that particular brand or sign, or if you're just importing products or exporting the products. So even if you put your brand on products and you only export them, that could still be deemed use within the Trademarks Act and also could be deemed infringement of a third party's brand. If you're using on advertising or on your business papers, for example, your letter heading, or if you're providing services under a particular sign. So never forget, it's not just a question of goods or products, but it's also services. So what's the point you're going to be saying to me? What's the point of spending this money? Why bother registering a trademark? Well, the most important thing is you want to present others from using your particular brand. You want to avoid damage to the reputation which you've acquired over a long time through somebody else providing faulty or substandard or even counterfeit products. You want to avoid consumers being confused and potentially going to the competitor and not to you. And you want to distinguish your goods, your products in the market. Secondly, you also want to make sure that your marketing spend goes much further. You're going to spend time building value in that brand. You're creating an intangible assets. And it's something which is very worthwhile. Further down the line, you might want to sell your business. The first thing they're going to ask you is, have you registered your trademarks? Have you registered your brands? Have you registered the name of the business? Am I going to be acquiring something, not just you know, the physical products or potentially taking over the leases, but am I also going to be acquiring intangible assets? And those intangible assets may be very valuable if been using that brand for decades. You'll have built up a lot of goodwill in that brand. So it's not even just a piece of paper showing you've registered it, but also the intangible assets attributed to the build-up in the brand of the goodwill. You could also build up revenue streams from having licensing agreements. So you could actually license the use of that brand maybe in a particular part of the UK. Or you could also build up revenue from trademark sales. So you actually sell a sign over the brand. Thirdly, and probably one of the most important thing is you can use that great little symbol, the R in the circle. The R in a circle can only be used if you register the trademark. If you haven't, then you'll be infringing the Trademark Act. If you haven't registered it, just use TM in block capital letters, because that doesn't actually mean anything. It doesn't mean you've registered the trademark, but a lot of your competitors might think you have, and so therefore it will be useful to use something next to the brand name. If you've got that R in a circle, it does provide assurance to consumers that the goods are official. So what kind of a brand, you know, if you're just kind of developing some brands for some of your products, what kind of brands should you really think about um, instructing, whether it's a, a design agency or whether you're doing it in-house? What kind of things should you be looking at? Well, what you want to avoid is any form of brand which actually describes the product, because you're not going to be able to register that. If it's descriptive, non-distinctive, as we tend to call it, the examiner is going to object to it. The examiner is going to be saying to you, I'm not going to give you a monopoly in a brand, in a name, which pretty much describes your product. But the more distinctive a brand in its marketplace, the wider its scope of protection. So if you do have a brand which is more a little bit borderline, um, a little bit descriptive, uh, then you won't have such broad protection. So, for example, rent a kill it vaguely alludes, it's elusive, but it's not descriptive. So it's fine. Decathlon, for example, in the sports equipment, it's less unusual. But what you can do with a brand which is borderline but not quite on the right side of the border in the sense that the examiner objects to it, they can what you call acquire distinctiveness. 
So in other words, you can go back and start using your brand. You won't have a registered trademark initially, but you could go back in two, three years' time, depending on how extensive your use is, go back to the examiner and say, look, I've been using this for three years. I can show now with sales figures, marketing spend, recognition in the marketplace, that my brand has acquired distinctiveness. It has become you know, less usual, as it were. Um, and depending on the evidence you file, it could be accepted onto the register. So one of the great misconceptions, um, and I have it all the time with clients, is that the company's house register is confused with the trademark register. Just because you have a company registered a company's house does not mean that therefore you've registered your trademark. They're completely distinct. So in essence, all of you members, all of you people on the call, I suspect, um, either have a trading name or a limited company, and therefore you probably all have automatically at least one brand because you're providing services, you're selling products under that brand, under that company name, trading name. So you should have registered that one, um, and then potentially you have others as well. So um, as I said a little bit before, you know, why bother? Okay, it's much easier to enforce a registered trademark. For example, if a competitor, a third party, starts using literally the same brand as yours, or the same products or the same services, all you need to do is go to court with a copy of your trademark registration certificate, and that's it. Uh, obviously, you know, if it's a similar brand, similar goods and services, you are going to have to file arguments and present evidence. The big difference is that with an unregistered trademark, there are lots of evidential hurdles you're going to have to go through. It's much more costly. It takes a lot longer. Even when you're sending your threats letter, you're threatening somebody, um, suit so one saying you might sue them if they don't stop using that particular brand. If you're just relying on unregistered trademarks, if you don't put any evidence with that threats letter, normally, if you've got a registered trademark, you just enclose copies of your certificate's registration. But if you haven't registered, you are going to have to um, provide evidence of what is the basis of your saying you've got an unregistered trademark. And the three tests within it is called passing off in the UK. You need to show, firstly, that you have a reputation, goodwill, use in the brand. Secondly, you have to show misrepresentation which is a bit like confusion in, in the marketplace. Have you had um, some indication of consumers being confused due to this other brand, which is similar to yours being used? And then you have to show damage, or at least a likelihood of damage, loss of profits, loss of sales. So as you can see, it's not that straightforward, a lot harder to enforce and a lot more costly. So just a quick kind of run through um, various kind of types of IP or intellectual property rights. If it's just a thought or an idea, they don't qualify. There's no form of IP protection for that. Um, intellectual property defines and protects human innovations and creations. So you've got trademarks, kind of brands, signal the origin of products. You've got designs, which are how products look, but they can also include logos, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. You've got copyright, uh, works of art, artistic creations. And then you've got patents. Patents protect technical inventions in all fields of technology. It's basically how things work. And trademark attorneys and patent attorneys, we work together within the same practice, the same firms, but we are completely distinct. So uh, patent attorneys, well, in our firm, don't do trademark work and trademark attorneys don't do patent work. Patent attorneys will all have a science background in whichever field they're specializing in, whether it's electronics, life sciences, chemistry, mechanical. So depending on their expertise, they will then only deal with patents or inventions in that area. Whereas trademark attorneys, most of us, not all of us, you don't have to have a law degree, but a lot of us will have a legal background um, and you don't need any particular science at all. So what about copyright? Copyright, uh, well, in the UK anyway, isn't registrable. So it's free, it's there, you have it automatically. You can register it in a lot of other countries, 
um, and China is one of them, the US. Um, and China is particularly useful because there's a lot of counterfeit products coming out of China, as you probably all know. Uh, we have constant problems. And um, so the fact that you can register copyright uh, is a good thing. And um, I'd always recommend doing so alongside with trademark registration and the design registration. Uh, build up a bit of an armor of um, IP protection. That's always the best way forward. So copyright um, works of art, but people forget about it because they tend to think of it as just like a, a book, a film, whatever. But actually, when you draft your prospectus, the wording in the prospectus, if somebody just lifts that, they're infringing your copyright. Strap lines. Um, you might have a strap line that you're using for your particular brand. You can register it as a trademark, but sometimes they're hard to register. Sometimes they might be a bit too descriptive, um, in which case, you know, you can claim copyright. In it. You can claim copyright in a font as well. if You've got a particular font developed for all of your branding. So it has to be an original work. You have to prove it's an original work, not copied from another. The author um, has to be qualified for protection. And if you're bringing infringement proceedings, uh, then the claimant, the person bringing the infringement proceedings or the company has to have had a title. There might be issues with commissioned works, of art, logos, designs, which I'll talk about a bit later on. But single words rarely attract copyright protection. So with a single word, you're definitely going to go down the trademark route only. And the thing about copyrights, you have to show copying by that third party of a substantial part of the original work. Whereas with trademarks, you don't. You don't have to show that they copied you, as in thought about copying you and looked at your work. You just have to show that that particular brand is close to yours or identical. Then you have designs. Uh, now, with designs, you can register them. And I strongly recommend that you do. It's a very inexpensive procedure, incredibly fast. There's no examination. We'll look at it a little bit more detail a few slides on. And you can also have unregistered design protection as well. The advantage of design registrations is similar to trademarks in the sense that you know, you're going to get your registration certificate. It's much easier to enforce uh, a registered design. It also lasts longer. A design registration lasts for 25 years. It's in five-year periods. You register it for five years, then you renew it subsequently up to 25 years. And after 25 years, it ends. I should have mentioned that trademarks, once you register it, it's for 10 years, but forever. So you can renew it every 10 years, forever. Uh, whereas the unregistered design rights only last either 10 or 15 years, 10 years from the first date of marketing, or up to 15 years from the first date of creation. And designs, uh, it's uh, very useful. We use design registrations for logos. So we will register a logo as a trademark registration and also as a design registration. And I'll explain why in a couple of slides. And obviously design registrations, you can also go protect the features of the design. Insofar as just in case um, you're thinking about this copyright protection um, lasts a lot longer, it is finite. As I said, you don't register it well, in the UK and it's life plus 70 years. So it is for a very long period of time. So how do I avoid infringement? Well, um, trademark searching is uh, really advisable. This is what's going to potentially raise conflicts with already registered brands. So the trademark search will look at um, identical trademarks, but also similar ones and for similar goods and services. So the actual analysis that's carried out um, looks relatively easy, but it isn't. So I will show you how you can do a ready reckoning, just kind of just a quick search yourself um, on the UK IP register. But I strongly recommend that you have a proper, what we call like clearance search carried out by a trademark attorney. The exam comes many years into, um, into whether it's three to four years I mentioned. Um, and as I said, it's not very, very straightforward. You can also flag up use of similar or identical unregistered marks. In the UK, as I said before, we have a system of unregistered trademarks uh, passing off. So it's quite useful to include what we call a common law search, and then that will look at what's being used in the marketplace, what could potentially somebody could enforce these unregistered rights. 
I say UK because um, EU obviously is, is completely separate now. And in the EU, uh, most uh, European countries or EU countries don't actually recognize unregistered trademarks. They have a system of uh, enforcing trading names and a few of them, um, but it's not as extensive as our system of unregistered trademarks. So our system is recognized as the same as in the US, Australia, some other countries, um, but it's certainly not recognized across the EU. So also when we carry out um, that clearance search, we should do it really early on in the stage. Don't unfortunately go down the route of having various brands created, falling in love as one does with one of the brands in particular, um, and, uh, and then finding out actually it conflicts with one which is already on the register and uh, you've already started spending money on, on um, pro you know, producing some packaging or, or whatever it may be. So try and do as early as possible. And when we do the clearance search, we will be advising you more fully. So not all of the brands on that register will be an absolute bar to use. We may consider the possibility of coexistence agreements. It may be that that other third party who already owns an earlier mark is in a slightly different field. Or we may consider cancellation. It may be that they haven't been using the mark and that therefore it could be canceled or revoked uh, for non-use. And uh, we could also look at invalidation. It may be that uh, for whatever reason, uh, the mark shouldn't be on the register. It's too descriptive or has become descriptive because obviously a lot of you know, things evolve, uh, especially in the media or computer uh, products, so software. So it means that certain terms which were registrable 10 years ago have become more generic. Or it may be just the owner's appetite for litigation generally. So. Those are all considerations that we would look at when we advise you how clear you are on using this particular brand. So how do you protect it? Well, um, you protect the trademark for particular goods and services. You have to specify what you want your trademark for, which I'll show you a bit further on. And um, you protect it for the particular jurisdictions or countries which are relevant. Uh, so uh, you need to start off with your list of countries. You start with the UK and then you'll expand from that. So you'll file in the UK and then you've got what we call a six month priority period. So you've got six months to think about which other countries you want to go into. And you file today in the UK and then you'll file, say, in the US or EU or wherever within six months. All of those other applications in other countries will be backdated to today. So you've got that six months window to build up funds and uh, really carefully look at your business, um, which are going to be relevant countries. And try to plan ahead because the UK is, well, it used to be pre-Brexit incredibly fast. It's a little bit slow at the moment because they've been inundated, but um, it would take maybe about four months um, pre-Brexit to register, maybe five months at the moment in the UK. Uh, but in other countries, you're talking about 12 to 18 months. So you really do need to think ahead. You file, which is fine because you put a marker in the sand, as it were, and all of your register rights will be, go back to that filing date. But you can't actually sue anybody, bring any proceedings until you've got the registered trademark. So that's why the delay period is quite important. As I said before, it's easier to enforce registered trademarks rather than relying on unregistered rights. So um, in some jurisdictions, first filing is particularly important. Um, as I said, EU countries, also China, um, a lot of Asian countries don't recognize the first use. They look at the first filing. And um, there's usually no obligation to start using a trademark until three to five years after applying. In the UK, EU, it's five years. In some Asian countries, it's three years. What that means is that if you haven't used your trademark within those five years, that's fine. But then if you start to enforce it, say in year six, um, somebody could apply to cancel, revoke your trademark registration for non-use. So it's very important that you do start using it within that period. Now, this is, as I said to you before, I was going to show you how you can do a bit of a searching yourself. You can go onto the UK IPO register, so the UK Intellectual Property Office register. Um, I've given you the... Um, website address there. And what you do is that you get a, they've actually kind of um, made the searching system much more user friendly. 
in the last year, which is good. And um, you can even type in similar or same or identical, and then you put in a particular word. It could just be one word. It could be a number of words. And then there's the classification bit. Um, I'll talk about classification uh, in the next uh, couple of slides. And um, that's the type of goods or services. And then you could also limit down if you're looking at a particular date. So applying for a trademark, you can uh, go ahead and apply yourself. You don't need to rely on us, on trademark attorneys, um, so long as you've got the key information, the mark, the list of goods and services, details of, it could be a company name, it could be an individual's name. It needs to be somebody who is entitled to, um, if it's going to be uh, a trading name, it needs to be somebody, an entity, such that they are entitled to have a legal title to um, own a trademark. So generally speaking, um, I would go for a limited company or for an individual. And it could be several individuals. The fees are relatively low, £170 for one class, £50 for each additional class. Obviously, if you go through a trademark attorney, there will be a service charge on top of that. But the advantage, obviously, is that we can draft a broader specification. We can advise you on any of the correspondence that comes back from uh, the registry. Uh, alternatively, you can file it yourself and then only get us involved uh, further down the line if there are issues. If you're registering a logo, normally it goes straight through. There are no problems. Uh, if you're registering any form of words, then there's more likely to be um, some queries or earlier marks uh, which the examiner will refer to. The examiner will provide in her or his examination report a list of the earlier marks, but only for information. The UK some time ago adopted the European approach to trademark registration, which is that the owner's responsibility is on uh, the owner of the earlier mark to file an opposition to actually try and block that application going through. The examiner, the registry, does not block the application. The examiner will allow an identical mark for identical goods going onto the registry all over again which wouldn't happen in countries uh, which still have what we used to have in the UK, uh, which is called relative examination. And uh, those are countries like, as you can imagine, US, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, et cetera. Um, so uh, that's why it's particularly important to be very vigilant and to keep an eye on what um, is being applied for and having a good uh, watching service for your trademarks once you've got it protected make sure you know what's being filed for. So as I said, I was going to go through, I'm just, I'm listed here, some of those which may be relevant to you um, and to give you some idea of what I'm talking about when I talk about classes or list of goods or services. So there are 45 classes and it's called the International Classification System, which has been adopted by most countries worldwide, even Canada has it now. Canada didn't used to have a classification system until recently, but they do now. And uh, I say uh, most countries worldwide, everybody, each country interprets them slightly differently. So you will get queries back from certain countries, especially some of the Asian countries, um, where they don't like the wording. And in fact, the UK is known to be, except quite broad terms, the US likely to be much narrower but we all have what we call international classification system adopting the same numbering. 45 classes in total and classes one to 34 are goods and classes 35 to 45 are services. So you need to think about goods, are you selling things, services, are you providing services? So in terms of goods, the ones I thought might be relevant to you are chemical substances in class one, um, the actual pest control preparations, pesticides, etc., in class five. Then in class nine, uh, the actual electronic insect killing apparatus, pest detectors. 21, the actual kind of physical pest traps. And then in terms of services, uh, class 35 is retail services. So actually kind of whether you're selling online or, or in a physical shop or have your own shops rather. And then class 37 is the actual service class, which is probably the most relevant for you, uh, which is detection, control, extermination of pests, uh, rental and leasing of apparatus, installation, maintenance, repair, and rental. And then 42 is the detection, control, and extermination of pests. 
uh, vermin insects and this is more on the um, kind of development side so you're developing types of detection services and then 44 is the service class where it's aimed at uh, agriculture horticultural forestry So here's an example of uh, the British Pest Management Awards registration. So as I said before, um, the filing date, which is 2017, sorry, it's a bit faint, I must admit, it's hard for me to see as well. Um, the filing date is all important because all rights are backdated to that date. And also the renewal date is from that date. So you can see here, it's 2017, it's filed, 2027 is when it's going to be renewed, and then 2037, 47, et cetera, every 10 years, forever. And then we've been talking about classifications, specification of goods and services. So here you can see that they have covered, um, the VPCA has covered classes 35 and class 41. So class 35 is for promoting the goods and services by arranging for sponsors. Uh, so it's like different to retail services, it's actually more of sponsorship services and awards. And then 41 is one I didn't mention because it's kind of hosting awards, which wouldn't, you wouldn't normally be doing, but obviously the association is. So um, once it's filed, um, you probably see at the bottom, it's a date of publication. So it's advertised um, electronically now, obviously. And um, from that date of advertisement, there's a period of two months and during which people who own earlier rights, whether those are registered or unregistered rights, um, so they could have an earlier registered trademark or they may have an unregistered trademark, unregistered design, whatever it may be, they can file an opposition. So they can try and block the application. That two months period can be extended to three months. So they can ask for an extra month, so long as it's within that two months period. And um, when they file the opposition, then that obviously stops your application going forward and you'll have to respond to the opposition um, and uh, defend it on the basis that maybe you'll narrow down your services, your list of services, or come to some agreement with them. And you should have, if it's based on earlier rights, you will have had some kind of notification and the examiner will have told you in her list, his list of earlier marks, so that you'll have some idea um, of what's going to be coming your way. Uh, the other ground on which you can block an application is bad faith. So if um, somebody has actually gone off and filed uh, a trademark application for your brand, an ex-employee, disgruntled employee, or whatever it may be, you could actually object to it on the basis of bad faith. So here's another one of the BPCA. And uh, this is obviously a logo, which I'm presuming as members, you are all very familiar with, because this is what we call a collective mark. You can see it under trademark category. It's not a normal trademark, it's a collective mark, which means that only the members uh, of that association who comply with whatever conditions the association have decided upon um, can actually use that mark. So that's why we call it a collective mark. And that one has been protected in class 37 for pest control services. So as I said before, the most relevant class for you. Here's an example of a design registration. So um, design, designs don't have, it says classification, but it's completely different. Um, with a trademark, you get a trademark, as I rem remember the last one, and that protection is only in class 37 for pest control services. So for whatever reason, somebody wanted to use that mark, which obviously they wouldn't because of the wording in it, but say they filed an application for BPCA, but it was for a completely different service class. Um, it was for entertainment services in class 41. Um, then it would be harder to enforce your registration because it's in a very different class, unless you have an extensive reputation for that brand. In designs, classification is not restrictive. Trademarks is restricted to the classes in which you protect. Designs are not. The classification is merely for the purposes of being able to search for design. So class 22 covers, uh, this is for traps for insects, uh, flying insect catchers. So it's protecting those kind of products, but it's not limited to that. So for whatever reason, somebody came up with a design a completely different function 
um, say as a household product, uh, which had nothing to do with insects, it wouldn't matter. You could enforce this design registration against anything in any sector. All it is has, would have to be um, take the distinguishing features of that design. You can also um, have up to, I mean, you can see the different views here, which is just different sides of the product. Um, and you can have up to 12. So you can have front, back, bottom, side, whatever. The other great thing about design registrations is that you can have multiple designs. So you can file one application and have any number of designs within the same application. And it's cheaper because for the subsequent registrations. So that's another advantage of it. Um, so the, um, the downside of design registrations only lasting 25 years is kind of made up by the fact that it's a very flexible system. Also, they're registered, uh, well, in the EU, they're registered within 48 hours. In the UK, two weeks. So uh, they're super fast. There's no examination. It's not like uh, with trademarks where they are looking at how you describe your goods. Uh, they're looking at whether it's descriptive or not. Designs, no. So long as you fulfill the form correctly, it goes straight through to registration. It will obviously then be challenged when you go to enforce it, um, potentially on the basis that um, it's not novel, but it was already um, in the marketplace. And um, novelty, you do have what we call a, a 12 months grace period. So if it has been used already, um, that's fine so long as it's within 12 months of the date in which you created it. You don't have more than that 12 months period. And obviously, if it was already out, out in the marketplace for a number of years, that particular design, um, then you'll still get your design registration because, as I said, it's not examined, but it will be challenged when you go to enforce it. So I mentioned before about the fact that when we um, protect logos for our clients, we protect them as trademark registrations and we also protect them as design registrations just because the breadth of the design registration system. So here's an example, the description, graphic symbols and logos. And as I said, this, what we call Locano classification, class 32, doesn't matter. It's just that that's the one that covers logos. But it's not restricting it. So if that was being used, we happen to be, for example, an insurance company, and that's used on a paint, we could still go against them with this design registration. It's irrelevant what the product is or the service. So how do I monitor for infringement of my brands? Well, um, I mentioned before about the fact that you do need to be vigilant and watching out for trademarks and what's being used, one aspect, and what's being filed for. So the watching service will provide you with um, a list of trademark applications being filed, whether it's UK only, UK plus EU, worldwide, whichever the relevant jurisdictions. And then, as I said before, you can file what we call oppositions. You can oppose these applications. They're relatively low cost registry proceedings. They're not court proceedings. And um, if you miss that deadline, that opposition deadline of two months in the UK, three months in the EU, um, then you can still bring um, an action once it goes through to registration. So it's not the end of the world and the costs are not much greater. You can take action against unauthorized use. Um, you should be seen in the marketplace to be defending your brands. That's going to be very important if you ever get to court. Um, if you've allowed a lot of use by third parties of your brand, not being vigilant, um, I mean, potentially, it may even lead to the brand becoming generic or, or overly descriptive. So send warning letters, threaten legal proceedings where necessary. And then maintain a detailed understanding of supply and distribution networks to identify potential source of bad faith applications. And then know the reach of your marketing communications and sales. So um, just keep an eye and keep everybody within your company aware of how important it is to make a note of where somebody might be using your brand or something similar. So somebody phones up reception and says, oh, I applied for this job at this company and realized it was the wrong one and not yours. So whoever takes that call and needs to make a note, a detailed note, date, person, et cetera. So it might be that you actually want to get a witness statement or evidence from that person to show confusion. 
So um, insofar as if you've got um, a design agency to create um, some of the product packaging or logos, uh, you want to make sure that when you commission the work um, that there is, it's all kind of in a written agreement the fact that the rights in that uh, logo, packaging, whatever, will come over to you as the company. Um, it's a very good idea to get that all formalized. Um, if they've got freelancers, um, then they should have uh, made sure that any of their contracts explicitly state that anything the freelancer produced is owned by the design agency. So um, always make sure that you ask that question. It's very tempting to just think, oh, design agency will know what they're doing and everything will be correct in, in their usual form of contract. But uh, I'd recommend actually asking it. So the key facts are, um, as I said before, that insofar as uh, jurisdictions are concerned, you do need to file in the relevant country. But obviously the problem with the internet is it's not actually limited, is it? It's worldwide. Um, and just because a trademark is being used on the internet in one country, that doesn't actually mean that the owner will be infringing in another. So there has to be some form of targeting. You need to be able to show that the websites in that local language, the prices and the payment are in that local currency, that there are local contact details, credit cards accepted, and um, potentially even a local TLD, .co.uk. Passive sales, where consumers seek goods outside that territory, it might be difficult to control. There may possibly be no liability. So what you want to do is you need to monitor any geographical sources of internet sales and add the relevant trademark protection, the R in the circle, um, if necessary, if relevant, depending on where you have registered your trademark. But internet usage is one of the hardest. Obviously, user takedown procedures as well, which are being offered by Amazon or, or whichever company is um, selling your products, because um, they're becoming a lot more efficient, even Alibaba has become very efficient in this. And um, I th it's very important to um, be on top of it. The other thing is with counterfeit, um, you need to take out um, customs notices, uh, especially now we've left the EU, you can't rely on the EU one anymore. So you need to make sure that the customs officials who filled in the relevant forms, they've got details of all of your trademark registrations and design registration so that they can monitor any counterfeit products coming into the country and stop them and give you the opportunity to bring proceedings. So, um, as I've said several times over, the important thing to remember is the fact that um, trademark is country specific. So you take out a registration in the UK. You have an EU registration which covers now the 27 EU countries, including Air, Ireland, and um, we were part of it, we're no longer part of it. So on the 1st of January, 31st of December uh, 2020, the UK IPO automatically granted free UK trademark and free UK design registrations to anybody who owned the equivalent EU registration. So everybody that's been all been replicated over. And that's why I was saying there are so many delays at the UK IPO because obviously the creation of all these extra registrations. And um, other countries you're going to have to protect on an individual basis. US, China, Japan are the ones I'm just bagging up, the ones of greatest interest to our clients. But there is a form of international trademark registration system. And this is under a system called Madrid Protocol. And what it means is that you get protection in the UK first, where you file in the first in the UK. And then you will file your international trademark application and you tick the countries you're interested in. It's not all countries worldwide, but it's a lot of countries and it's most relevant ones. The ones which are not part of this system are um, a lot of the Arab countries. So UAE, Saudi, Kuwait, and uh, you will have to apply nationally in those countries. Um, Hong Kong is still has, it still has its individual trademark registry for a while. And then uh, some, uh, most of the South American countries are not part of it, although Brazil has joined and Colombia. So, um, but as I said, most other countries, Canada, US, Australia, New Zealand, um, Japan, as I said, are part of it. And you will pay according to which countries you want protection in. You file it and then each of the national registries in those national countries um, will then examine it. 
And if they don't examine within 18 months of when you filed it, it's deemed to have been accepted. Um, so in some countries, which are quite slow, for example, India, it may be that they don't um, actually examine it within those 18 months. So then you automatically have the registered protection. But it is looked at on a national basis. And obviously, your UK attorney will be able to deal with the process, the administrative side of filing that international registration, ticking the countries that you're interested in, EU block plus others. Um, and then when it comes to examination, if it's EU, the UK attorney will probably have EU attorneys working with them who can deal with it. But if it's a problem in Australia or US, they will need to get local um, qualified uh, advice from attorneys out in those countries because we're only qualified in the UK now. So a bit of a whistle stop tour, but um, I'm going to stop talking now and let you do the talking <laughs> uh, or via your questions anyway. And um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tanya. That was really interesting. Uh, I've got loads of questions, um, so we'll have a quick look through all of those now. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes to get through these questions, so if you do have any more, anybody in the audience, please, please do pop them in that Q&A box. Um, an interesting one here from an anonymous uh, attendee. So they, they've said if somebody in Europe has been using your EU registered trademark for a long time, for a long time, i.e. 15 years, can you still challenge it? Um, and, and would there be any way of uh, uh, suing for somebody using uh, your trademark for such a long time? So um, I'm just trying to get my head about which way around it is. So uh, somebody in Europe has been using, uh, so you've got an EU registered trademark and um, somebody else has, uh, you can obviously challenge it, it's all about in Europe or EU rather, it's all about the date of registration or the date of filing. So it's all going to be backdated to that. So um, if they, for whatever reason, had been using the brand prior to when you filed your application, um, I doubt very much, but it will depend on which country it is as to what kind of unregistered rights they have through trading names. Each country, Germany, Austria, Sweden, whatever, has different systems on unregistered rights. And you have to go to actually somebody who's qualified in that country to actually understand what they are. Um, but so far as um, I understand and how we've been operating, they're very, very limited. So uh, everything that's crucial is about when you filed your trademark in the EU and your dates are backdated that. And so long as you've been using it as well. Thank you. I, th I think that will probably cover uh, that question off. I can see here, so uh, Chris has asked if if he decides to change the font or layout of his trademark, does he need to resubmit it as a trademark completely? So this is really interesting and it's something which um, one always kind of sighs slightly when design agencies get involved or new marketing departments um, because they always want to tinker with trademarks. So the golden rule I always say to clients is register it as what we call a word mark and block capital letters. Don't put any font or any stylization into it. Um, and that way you've got protection. You can use it any which way. And if they change it, then it doesn't matter. If you have registered it in a, with a particular font, um, it will depend on how unusual or distinctive that font is and whether it makes the word look slightly different because it could be challenged. So it could be that they will say you've been using it you registered it in one font, you're using it in another, and you're not using it in the way in which you have registered it. So yes, word of warning, only register in block capital letters. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Every time a, a new marketing team comes in, everybody wants to change something. And you, you know, what, what impact does that have on the rest of the business? Uh, I'm not sure it's the first thing that you think of is, is your trademark protected still? Yes, I mean, the thing, I mean, I, I don't, I'd say to clients, it depends how deep your pockets are, but definitely go down the route of registering both. But if you're only registering one of them, do it in block capital letters. And then as there's enough money left over, do it in a second way as a separate registration completely. Um, because it may be that the font is particularly or visually, you know, interesting and somebody might pick out some of the visual aspects, but not the actual word. And then you could actually attack them based on that registration or the font and stylization. So, it's not don't register it, but just don't prioritise it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, so we've got a question that says, do I get any protections for registering my company as a limited company, so through Companies House or? No, so um, obviously uh, Companies House is, is purely a list of company names. Um, and so what you, um, what you are effectively getting is a registered company, uh, an LTD or whatever it may be. So it's not, it doesn't have any impact on trademark registrations per se. It, it, it will be evidence to show that um, you've been using that brand since a particular date of when you registered the company name, uh, but it will not have any impact in the sense you still need to register as a trademark separately. Thank you. Um, Alad has asked, and I think there's probably a more general question here, is, is names of companies in other countries. So if you have a UK trademark and you see it uh, being used in the USA, is there anything you can do at that point or have you missed the boat? Um, so uh, the, if, you, if you've got, um, the thing is everything's jurisdictional. So everything's going to depend on what's already, you know, in the U.S. on the register. The U.S. have a very uh, sophisticated system of unregistered rights, uh, even more sophisticated than ours, uh, and very easy to, relatively easy to enforce. So it's very important when you're looking at the U.S. market to see not only what's on the register, but what's being used. They also have a system of uh, federal registrations for trademarks and state registrations for trademarks, although we always go down the federal route, obviously. Um, but uh, so that's even more complicated and they have different two different parts of the register. So if you've got a non-distinctive trademark, you can get it onto uh, like a part B register. So it's uh, it is one of those areas where I strongly uh, suggest that you get U.S. attorneys involved. You really don't want to go, go down the route in the U.S. of being on the receiving end of an infringement action. Um, you can, you know, write away £100,000. I mean, it really is crazy, even on a trademark dispute or whatever. So. Uh, definitely get advice and um, and make sure that yeah that, that there's no possibility of your infringing it and if you think the US is an important market go and register yeah it sounds as if it's the time to call in your uh, chartered trademark attorney at that point um, <laughs> brilliant thank you um, an interesting question here which is is uh, on the subject of copyrights more than trademarks but it's about um, can you infringe on a copyright on a strap line? So they've put an example here, but I'll use our own. So driving excellence in pest management is one of our, our strap lines at the BPCA. Would somebody putting driving excellence in pest control be uh, an infringement in copyright? Yeah, so I mean, the thing about copyright is that first of all, you need to prove it. Um, so you need to be able to prove when, when somebody came up with that strap line. Um, and also copyright is relatively narrow in the sense that um, you have to show that, that the major part of it has been lifted um, and that uh, it warrants copyright in the sense that it, it's not you know, overly uh, generic in, in terms of, of the actual phrase. So uh, the judge is unlikely to kind of grant you protection if it's, if it's just a very kind of commonplace phrase. Uh, so that's um, you know, making your pests our problem and we make your pests our problem. I would say that's quite a generic phrase and that therefore you're not going to succeed based on that. It has to be uh, a bit more inventive than that to deem to be copyrightable, as it were. And as I said, this is an unregistered right. So it's free. It's there. You have it automatically. Um, it's a bit like, you know, unregistered design rights. It's only when you go and try to enforce them that somebody's going to challenge your uh, allegation that you actually own IP rights in that phrase. Thank you. Uh, we've got a new question that's just come in. Uh, can I register a process or pest control technique if it is clear and different from anything else? I'd love to know who this anonymous t uh, attendee was so we can find out a bit more about it. But in principle, ca can you uh, get a trademark for a process? So you can't in the sense that uh, the this is going to be something which potentially could be patentable, and then it's going to be a question of whether it's innovative, whether it is generally kind of something new, which a patent attorney is going to have to look at, um, depending what the process is, whether it's a mechanical process or whether you're talking about pharmaceutical, whatever technique it is, whatever your eradication you're looking at. But in terms of trademark protection, no, uh, a trademark is uh, very much something uh, visual. So that's why I was going to say, like with a logo, if you've got a moving logo, um, you can register it as a moving logo. It is visual. It's not the description of something like a process. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Just a, a couple more questions. We've got a couple more minutes left. Uh, somebody has asked if we can put the uh, site for checking tra trademarks into the chat. What I'll do is I'll send it out with the feedback survey at the end. So we'll get that to you from the presentation. Um, so what can I, what's the first thing I should do if I can see somebody is using my trademark? So um, the most important thing of all is to work out when they first started using your trademark, because it may be they've been using it longer than you. And so what you think is your trademark may actually be their trademark. <laughs> um, and so uh, if you can find out yourself great from the Internet and as I look at companies house when they registered their company name, whatever, uh, we tend to instruct investigation agents who will do it on a confidential basis uh, so that nothing is disclosed and they'll then find out on that us for our client uh, but we're talking you know there are costs involved but um, don't go into these things gung-ho just presuming oh that's mine therefore I have early rights work out in a date format who got the first, first rights so maybe they registered the mark you know last year but they might have been using it for five years previously so it's not even the date of registration which is relevant in the UK you need to see the date of first use brilliant thank you it definitely covers that one off um, and I suppose probably our last question for the day now, uh, and something that some people might be thinking in our audience, can you be just too small to need to bother to register a trademark? So my uh, recommendation always, as I said, if you've got a company name, you must be using that for your services or for your products. Um, and uh, for £170, or depending if you've got extra classes, it's certainly worth going down that route. Um, it is, um, especially if funds are not great, I think that it's just, it's a really useful um, per piece of kind of, you know, IP protection to have. It's going to be so much more expensive, probably litigation costs maybe three, four times more if you're looking at unregistered rights. So definitely go down the route of protection. You don't need to protect it in every single format, just protect it in block capital letters. You don't need to protect all of your brands. You might want to just protect the major ones. You don't need to protect all of the countries, just protect the major ones. The add-on costs come on, not so much in the UK, but other countries with extra classes. Um, so just um, prioritize, first of all, the company name or the name of your business, then prioritize key brands and key jurisdictions, key countries. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tanya. That was really interesting. Um, we'll get your presentation up on our YouTube channel. So if you've missed anything or want to go back to something, uh, please do check it out there. By the, It should be up by the end of the week. But thank you so much again for talking to us. And thank you for everyone that joined us. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Stay safe.